the legendary Amal Easton. Sold all his things, moved to Brazil, <laughs> and got me to do the same. Thanks, brother. Thanks for hanging out. Always, always great talking to you. I was looking through my phone the other day, and I saw I still have your mom's phone number because she was worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, is it is it true that you uh you grew up in a teepee in New Mexico? You know, I was when I was born. We were, I was in a teepee for about the first two and a half years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> then we moved up. We got moved into a like um, an adobe house. My my parents got divorced. My Mom moved into a box car. My dad moved into an Adobe house. But we still had like no electricity, no running water, no phone. <laughs> maybe maybe that's the right way. I, did, I, did I tell you about we went to Armenia like was it last year? And uh they they these guys lived in the ca in caves uh, uh -huh. the seventies. And then mm -hmm. uh and then so the, the you know they, they built them like I think apartment buildings and everything else during communism. And yeah. the people, they didn't want to stay in the apartment buildings. They actually mm -hmm. went back to the caves and lived there and had babies and all kinds of stuff. It's like recession proof, bro. <laughs> you're, you're good, man. Fuck that. <laughs> you could have the Great Depression, all that. No problem. COVID, not such a big problem. There's only a couple of you in the cave. No worries, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe in that's in our, when we moved into the little adobe house, there was no floor. It was a dirt floor, so you didn't have to sweep as much. There you go, huh? That's the way. That's good, That's man. The way. We, we just complicate stuff. Right? <laughs> I don't know what we're doing. Keep it simple. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah, I got this big old house now. I have to hire cleaners. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you, uh, you, uh, you went to acupuncture school, and, uh, and he, we started jiu-jitsu, right, and with Marco in, uh, in Santa Fe. And what made you just sell all your things? What made you, you know, just drop everything and move to Brazil? Man, like I got out of school, I didn't want to go to work. Like I, I've always maybe had a, a different perspective on life. Maybe my parents always told me like, what's important is you're happy, not that you're, you know, not the money, not any of that other bullshit. Like they were like, you know what? Not only, you know, do we not care that much if you go to college, but don't go to college. Mm. <laughs> you know, they're like, if you really have something that you want to do and, and you need to go to college to do it, then cool. But What's important is that you're happy. And if you're, you know, if you can find something that can pay your bills that you're happy doing, then you'll be very good at it. I don't know if that's the right advice or not, because I've seen it go south for lots of people, but that was kind of what I did is just said, all right, I'm just going to go have fun then, you know? And so I always chased positive things, but I always just kind of, you know, tried to have a good time. <laughs> and so then Brazil, I wanted to go learn Portuguese I'd never lived on the ocean. I wanted to learn to surf. Uh, you know, it was, it was you easy. Know, what was that? What was it your first days? Like you told me, like you were eating cat crackers and uh, drinking Coke, Coca Cola for like. The first yeah, because back in the day, you know, it was 1995. Anything you read about Brazil was just about how dangerous it was. And you're going to get sick. I had a friend that went there and got this amoeba that goes in through your foot from walking in the beach. And he got super sick. Um, and I mean, every single person I talked to who'd been to Brazil said, you're going to get robbed. Rio's the worst place in the world. It got to the point where somebody would say, oh, man, I've been to Brazil. You know, my, my brother's been to Brazil. You should talk to him. And I'd say, no way, man, because <laughs> I'm going, you know, yeah. I'm going. And, they're just, and nobody said anything positive about Brazil. It was insane. So Even I, if they said something positive about Brazil, it for sure wasn't about Rio. And Rio was where jiu-jitsu was. So I didn't want to hear it. I had to actively avoid those people. Yeah. So then when I got there, I was wandering around and I was afraid to eat anything that wasn't like cooked or that might've been touched by somebody. Like the first night it was just like, I found some crackers and a Coca-Cola and that's not, that's not me. It's not how I grew up either. I grew up like, you know, all natural food, you know, real food. And yeah. so there I was like eating crackers, drinking a Coke, my first night with a bunch of cops pointing machine guns at me. And I was like, man, I think I made a big mistake. <laughs> I, I but, I, but I was already in. I'd already sold every single thing I owned, bought my ticket, showed up in Brazil. So there was no turning back. What's the machine gun story? I had never heard about that. 
I, I stayed in Copacabana because everybody said, oh, you know, that was the only place that you could find places like hotels. Mm -hmm. So I, I stayed in Copacabana and uh, I was wandering around one night and uh, first, first I was like, oh, look, that looks like a nightclub on the beach at this place called Help. And I went to Help. <laughs> and I, I was like, this is kind of weird, you know, there was lots of pretty girls there. And they were looking at me kind of funny. And I thought, man, this has never happened to me before. I'm from a small town, you know. And then uh, I got kind of scared. And so I left. It turned out that was a prostitute bar right on the beach. Crazy. Right. But I, I got scared. This girl was looking at me like she was going to eat me for lunch. And I was just eating my crackers with my Coke. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, God, she sure is pretty, but this is horrifying. So I, uh, <laughs> so I started walking down the street and then earlier that day, I'd met these guys, actually Egan and Ensign Inouye from uh, Hawaii and they were pro fighters and uh, they'd taken my dictionary and he goes, man, I'm meeting so many Brazilian girls. You gotta like, and I was like, how do you meet them? And he goes, you just got to say these things to him. And I go, what? And so he took my, my dictionary and he wrote down like three things in it. It was like, I need some love or like these totally cheesy, like if you spoke no Portuguese and just looked it up. And so I had this dictionary with that written in it. I was afraid to carry my passport because I thought for sure I was going to get robbed and stolen. And I had my crackers and my Coca-Cola and I was walking to my hotel, which was about three blocks off the beach. And there was all these cops stopping cars. And so I, I did what every American does when they see cops is you stop and you look at them. You go, what are they doing? <laughs> and the, I'll tell you what you don't do in Brazil is look at the cops. Cause when you look at the cops, man, they're like, oh, this guy wants to talk to me. And so they saw me looking at him and they said, you come over here. They walked over with their machine guns and they said, what's that in your hand? And I was like a dictionary and they took my dictionary and opened it up and it's had all these like cheesy pickup lines in it. And they're like, oh, this kid's trouble. And then they started like searching me and they all took turns pointing their machine gun at me. I'm sure they wanted money, yeah. but, um, but it was scary, man. I was like, oh my God, that was like my first or second night. That's crazy, man. <laughs> so what was the process? Like, you know, we trained at Greece to Baja, right? And we're in Baja to Chuka. Uh, what was the process of getting, getting a car because you had like a you had a, a Volkswagen Beetle, a yellow Volkswagen Beetle yeah. that you lent me after you left. Mm -hmm. It was like the Flintstones car because the 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 bottom had rusted out a little bit, so we yeah. we could run with our feet on the ground, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you could definitely so see the pavement. <laughs> <laughs> but it was amazing to have a car right down there. But what was the process of you getting a car and then finding finding the Jiu Jitsu gyms and what was that process like? I mean, I got a car like six months in because I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have transportation? I lived on this little island and the only way to get there, as you remember, because I put you in a boat with a, a stick to try to get there. <laughs> the only, <laughs> only way to get there was with this little rowboat and they would always steal your oars. So you'd, get, you'd go to your boat, which was locked, but you couldn't lock the oars. And then you'd search around for some kind of stick, which there weren't many of, right. <laughs> as you remember. And then you'd have to sit on the point of the rowboat so it would jack the rear end up. And then you'd kind of do this J stroke to try to keep it straight and not just go in circles. But that took skills. That wasn't, good. That wasn't for amateurs, Alberta. Um, and so you paddle home. And then at the house, there was no phone. Literally, it was $7,000 for a phone line. Mm. There was no cell phones. There was barely cell phones. And so you'd have to pay like four thousand dollars to own the line for a cell phone and then you had to pay like three thousand dollars for the phone and then you had to pay all the bills or you could get a landline the landline was about you could buy it used you could find a landline used for like six thousand dollars and then you'd be on a wait list for like maybe one or two years to have them install your phone it was insane and i was like what do you mean six thousand dollars to buy a phone line and they're like, well, what do you mean? You oh, Then you'll own part of the phone company because you'll have the line. It's an investment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't make sense, man. It should be like 1995 to get your line set up and you should have it by tomorrow. But Brazil's different, man. Right. As you know. So like, I, I, so the, a car felt like the ultimate mode of like freedom because nobody could go to my house. Nobody could call me. I couldn't get anywhere. Um, so... Uh, Hold on one sec. Hey, I can't talk now, but I'll be able to in 45 minutes. So, um, yeah, it was tough. Um, 
But then it was even crazier when I bought the car. Like, it would just take so many hours to get one thing done. Like, I bought the car, and then I went to uh, downtown to get, like, my driver's license. And when I got there, it was, I mean, it was 110 degrees, super high humidity, impossible to find this place. Like, I'm going into the wrong neighborhoods. I don't speak English. No one knows what the hell to think of me because I'm an American, so I must be rich. But I'm driving this piece of junk Flintstones car. So it, I was a total anomaly. I, I was a walking oxymoron. Nobody knew what to think, you know. I get downtown. I actually, the day I went downtown, I took the bus. So I took the bus there it took hours it was just sweltering heat and when i got there i barely made it because it took way longer with traffic than i thought it was going to take so finding this building was a nightmare and when i find it i go up and i'm like yeah yeah and i walking up i'm exhausted i'm about to die and um and the security guard this poor guy he, he goes whoa 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 and i'm like this is the detron right the, the you know where i can get my license and stuff and he goes well yeah but not like that. And I'm like, what do you mean not like that? He goes, no shorts, no shorts in here. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like I just went three hours on the bus in 150 degree heat and I can't go in there without sh with shorts on. And he's yeah. like, no shorts. And I'm like, fuck. And then I'm like, oh wait, I have my kimono because I was going to go train on the way home. <laughs> and so I like right in front of him, I put my bag down and I pull my kimono pants out and I put them on and I go, are these okay? And he goes, ah, he had a big smile. He goes, you do jujitsu. I'm like, yeah. He was like, cool, go on in. You're good now. You have pants. <laughs> so like everybody's in like, I don't know how they do it. All these people must have like, I don't know how they do it because everybody's wearing like like three piece suits to go to the freaking motor vehicles department. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, and they've got their attorneys representing them because you can't get a driver's license without an attorney because everybody's attorney, an attorney and they need work. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, there I am in my freaking jujitsu oh, pants. Where was the DMV? No attorney. Where was the DMV? It was downtown. downtown. You know, like where they sell all the pirated DVDs and stuff. <laughs> the place you took me to uh, for my first meal. Yeah, it was right by. It was close actually to where we got uh, the the legendary lizard meal. Your your inaugural uh, Brazilian meal. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> Man, yeah. so how did you find how did you find the island to live on? We lived right. You're explaining like we had to take like a let's pay a few cents to take a little boat to get to the front of the island. You got to walk to the side of the island, and then we had to paddle a boat to get to the front of our house. How did you so, find that house? What was the story with that? This brings, like, I feel like I have to correct an inaccuracy that you just said, because okay. this was like, when I moved to Brazil, I had saved up $17,000. And the minimum wage was $350 a month. A so month. when I saw that, I thought, I'm going to be rich. Like, I'm set. Like, I, I could probably retire for the rest of my life with 17000 so I put 5,000 in a bank account for my cushion when I get back because, you know, the teepee wasn't really throwing off a whole bunch of cash. And so when I got back, I was going to need something to get started. And I had 12 grand. I figured that'd last a long time. Well, when I got there, first of all, when I, the, the dollar, they just totally changed their currency and they pegged the dollar one-to-one -one with the real. So as you remember, it was expensive. It was yeah. very expensive. So when I got there, I was like, oh, this is so cool, a boat. And it's only a dollar to go across. But when you live there, you go back and forth like three times during the day. That's six bucks. Yeah. And I didn't have much money. So, I mean, whew, at first I was like, oh, this is like you pay, you, you pay a dollar. No problem. And then I was like, oh, man, I don't have a job. I'm broke as a joke. <laughs> like, this is going to eat me. Mm -hmm. So I've lived in some tough places. Like, And when I say tough, like, I don't know, growing up in New Mexico was interesting, right? Frankly, it didn't feel quite as far as danger, it felt similar to Brazil in my mind. Mm. Um, but I, I lived in Telluride, Colorado. And Telluride was so exorbitantly expensive because I was obsessed with skiing. And since my mission was to have fun, I moved to a ski area so I could ski every day. But there's no place to live there. Like people there, it's like these people are either like uber wealthy or they're like from my side of the town and they literally live in caves and tree houses and their car, it's so expensive in the middle of winter. Right. So when I was there, I found a place to live just literally walking around. Hey, 
Does anyone have a room or a basement or anything that they would rent me? Because you look in the paper and there's a thousand people looking for three apartments that are, you know, thousands of dollars more than I can afford. Right. So when I was in Brazil, no, first of all, nobody really lives on their own because they can't afford to. So the only reason they live, especially back in the day, they would live on their own if they were like um, starting their own family. Like when you got married and you're rich, you got, you're rich, you're getting married, so you're starting your own family, so your parents buy you a house. It's pretty much right. how it works, right? Or you're a serial killer and your own mom and dad kick you out of their house. That's the only two reasons. Because if you're broke and you're starting a family, well, then you, you, you probably sleep on the floor next to your mom and dad. Like, and there'd be eight people in one room. Right. So, I mean, like I said, I was a walking anomaly because I was trying to convince people I was not a serial killer, which, you know, was hard to do over the phone when I don't speak the language. I, I'm not starting family. I'm not rich. So, like, none of the things added up, you know? So, I'm like, I could not find a place. So, you were shaking hands. You were just shaking hands. Randomly. So, I was walking down the beach. And I was like, and, and with my dictionary in my hand, because as you remember, my dictionary did not leave my hand. It was my I'm, Bible. I'm, I'm trying to put a picture to it. And your Speedos? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. But the Speedo is another story. That's a good one, though. Damn, you're bringing up all good, some solid ones. I'm walking down the beach, and, I'm, and I don't have Speedos, so I'm kind of standing out because all the Brazilian men have Speedos. Mm. So I'm looking like a real American in my big old, you know, long knee that probably helped you that probably helped you they made you they made it they, like you probably were except then they're like should we rob this guy or charge him three times more for his apartment or they don't know what the hell to think you know <laughs> so i'm like literally walking up and down the beach and i'm like hey do you know of a place i could rent people are just like the hell is this guy and i come across this like there's these family kind of sitting on this blanket actually it wasn't a family it's a bunch of girls it was a gaggle of girls like eight of them and wow. i was i was I came from a small town, man. I had to work up my courage to go and like say one word and say, hey, hey, uh, you, uh, they, they saw me actually. And they're like, they started like saying there are two words of English that they spoke. And I was like, sweet. I have someone's attention. Mm. Beautiful girls. What should I ask them? I know. Do you know of a place that I could live? And then they were like, actually, we live on an island and we know a place where you might be able to rent. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I've been looking for like a week. And, and, and an island, I can't even fathom what that looks like in Brazil. So I have no idea. And they're like, well, yeah, hang out with us and then come with us and we'll go, we'll take you there. I'm like, no way, jackpot. Wow. So they take me to the island. We go across the boat. I'm like, this is magic. Um, you know, there's kind of a mixed, mixed sort of houses there. There's like run down mansions and then kind of shanties. And uh, they took me to this place and that like started the whole windfall me being able to stay there because you had to be rich to be in brazil back then there were no tourists right like there was a few guys like ensign egan Inouye, mark johnson i think kazeka made it down there for a bit obviously right. you did but not many people could stay in rio it was so expensive and and most of the guys would stay for like two weeks mm. and for two weeks maybe they'd stay in an expensive hotel most of those guys were a little older than me um and so you know and, and maybe they didn't come from a dirt floor teepee. <laughs> but uh, so I was trying to figure it out, man. I just had to make it work. And I found it. I made it work. And that was, you know, there's all sorts of crazy stories in there, too. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> man. So you, 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 you were staying in a hotel in Copacabana? Uh, my first two days. Okay. There, there, was, there was some interim places there. Two days in Copacabana. And then one of the guys at the academy, okay. this guy goes, hey, he goes, there, you can stay at my place. I can't stay there because I'm super allergic to mold. So you can rent my place. You can take my lease over. And I'm like, mold? What the hell is that? I'm from New Mexico. It's dry as the joke. There's no mold there. So I'm like, New that sounds great. And so I go and it's a mansion. It's sick. The only problem is you have to walk like a mile to get there from the bus. But okay. it's, I mean, ridiculous. Especially if you, you're like, you can't find a place to live. You're stoked. Yeah. And yeah. the price was pretty reasonable. Uh -huh. um, and the guy was kind of weird, but I don't care. And the place was huge. I mean, he's like on the other side. The place was probably, it was probably 6,000 square feet. And there was just me and my buddy, Mark Johnson, had a room there too. And I'm like, this is great. And he goes, the only problem is the guy's kind of loud. And I'm like, 
Yeah. I, you know, fuck, man. I just want a roof over my head. Loud, mold, loud. I don't even know what that means. And so I like, I, I'm going to sleep the first night and it's gorgeous, peaceful. I'm like, this is amazing. I have my earplugs next to my bed just in case. And I'm like, I don't even know what that guy's talking about. I'm stoked. And then at two in the morning, it starts. The guy comes home with these, these ladies, probably prostitutes, comes home. And they're on the, uh, there's like a courtyard in the middle of the place. I'm on like the second floor. And I can look across the courtyard at this window. And it's this guy, Nelsinho. Nelsinho? Nelson and his friend are there. And they start partying at like two in the morning. And um, it like cocaine, liquor. The thing about Nelson is when he drinks, he's a really nice guy, kind of weird when he's not drunk. When he drinks, he screams. So from two in the morning until six in the morning, he's like, I don't know how anybody puts up with that guy. The, 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 that's how I know they were hookers because you, you could not possibly hang out with this dude like that if you weren't getting paid because he's just like rah, 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 all night long. And there was no way I couldn't sleep. And, you know, it's, it's hot. And so all your windows are open. It was like he was screaming in my ear all night. And then I was afraid to leave. So I talked to Henzo at the academy the next day. He was like, man, what's wrong? I was like, uh, falling asleep on the mat. And I go, man, I'm staying at this place and I just can't be there. And he goes, where are you staying? And I go, Nelsinho. He goes, Nelsinho? Oh man, he just had a shootout with the cops last year because he was just whacked out of his brain and the cops came to talk to him. And instead he had like a shootout with them. Oh I'm like, oh my God, what kind of trouble am I in? And he goes, don't worry about it, man. Just go back, tell him, because Henzo would always like, uh, Henzo, all would ha- uh, Henzo has a solution for every problem in a very positive way with a smile and a joke. Doesn't matter how bad this, the problem is. So he's like, go back. You tell him that, you know, you can't stay there and like, you need, you need your money back. And, uh, and, and if he doesn't take care of it, tell me and we'll go talk to him together. So I'm like, all right, cool. And I told him and Nelson was totally cool. He was super apologetic. He was like, I'm, I know, I'm sorry. And I was like, oh my God. And then I was homeless again. And that was when I ended up walking on the beach and found those girls. Cause I was like, oh, what am I going to do? So you found, and then you, you met, uh, you met, uh, what's his name? Um, Adamir. Uh, Adamir. So I started out with the first place they took me was this guy. Uh, I don't remember his name, but I think he's like, he's well, good. Right, I got to backtrack a minute, you know, because when I went down, you asked me to bring a kayak with me on the plane. Mm-hmm. My dad still gives me a hard time for that because we have to It's travel. Brazil. Everybody's got to have a kayak. Okay. There are ocean kayaks, but you had a river kayak because you're like extreme yeah. kayaker or skier guy. Yeah. And so you had me bring a river kayak, right? And you almost died. And so that's the second kayak that you had, you were going to have in Brazil. So what's the yeah. story? You were trying to find an apartment, but you already had a kayak. So where was that kayak that you brought down the first Man, time? The thing is, those kayaks were, were super special to me, right? The first kayak, I was like, uh, I, was, I was a pretty solid kayaker. And, mm-hmm. and uh, my buddy worked with a, a, a kayak company, Wave Sport. And he said, man, we, we, I can probably get you one of these kayaks. It's a light layup, so it's not real not quite as solid as the other one. So it's good for the ocean. And I could probably get it for you for free if you just get us some photos of you surfing on the beach in Rio in the kayak. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, sweet, you know, just some PR, you know? Yeah. So they got me this kayak. And then um, I almost, I got, I got some good PR. Let's say that I was on the news. You made the news. They, yeah, I was on the news. Yeah, because they sent a helicopter after me because I almost died. <laughs> I got sucked out of the ocean. I thought that I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. I grew up in the desert. And in, in, in first grade, they taught you how to do the dead man's flow, which seemed ridiculous. Nobody even has swimming pools in New Mexico. It's not like Arizona that's warm all year round. Yeah. So like, there's no water. There I was like going right back to first grade, doing the dead man's float while the ocean was pulling out. I lost that kayak. So then you were coming down. That was actually probably half the reason I tried to get you to come down is just so you could bring me a kayak. <laughs> also, I thought the other half is I knew would be good for you. But the first half was I needed a kayak, man. So I was like, Ugh, who can I get to bring me a kayak? Because I really missed it. I only got to use it a couple of times. Okay, but you, did you have, did you, you, you went to Copacabana, you were staying in a hotel, you had a kayak with you. How did you, how did you manage that? You first got to Brazil, you have a kayak. How do you deal with that? You know, what's funny is that I brought a kayak, but I didn't bring any other niceties. I didn't bring like my Walkman. I didn't bring any like cassette tapes. I didn't bring 
any music because I was like, I'm going to be Brazilian. Like, I'm going to learn Portuguese. I'm going to like, I brought, I'm going to wear Portuguese, Brazilian clothes, which is another story. Mm. But uh, so I was going to blend in. But my kayak, you know, it's going to be ocean. I don't know. <laughs> you know what happened? I met a guy and he let me store the stuff at his house. I rolled McDowell. He's like an old school black, black belt. He, okay. So you met to, him. You met you. First thing you did is go to the, go to the, go to the gym, the jiu-jitsu gym. And then you met, you met people to help you out kind of. No, but oh, man, there's so much. I went to, uh, cause I mean, it's crazy. Like city. going to like a third world country, all these people are telling you you're yeah. going to die basically. Uh, yeah. you know, blah blah blah, and you do it anyway. And then, like, yeah. what 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 do you you know? You go from the airport. You you don't really know anybody, right? In Brazil at the time. So I went through New York on my way because my grandma lived in New York, and I'm and I and there was one jujitsu academy in New York back then. It was run by a guy named Fabio Clement. I remember. And Fabio that. Clement was like super cool, and in his academy there was a businessman visiting who was really good at jujitsu. He was a black belt mm-hmm. named Aroldo McDowell, and Aroldo said oh man when you come if you need you know if i can help let me know and yeah. uh so i stored my stuff at his house while i kind of oh, okay you know while i was a gypsy okay okay figuring out that, where to that, live that makes sense. i was like how, how are you carrying a kayak around with you trying to find a house mm-hmm. i got you okay okay so you finally meet uh uh Ademir, uh yeah at, at the beach how, how did that process to find the the apartment that we that you stayed in or the, the well the house. girls the girls took me to this guy Zeka was his name and he Zeka. had a house with a bunch of rooms up above and then he rented out all the rooms to kind of survive some some cool people lived there like Danielle Samoas or Danielle Gracie lived oh. there and he was a rock star I mean yeah. just when you met the guy you were like holy shit yeah. like he's the most good looking strong charismatic spoke great English like super friendly chill yeah. Like just one of the coolest guys you've ever met in your life. Yeah. It's hard to fathom how cool Danielle is to this day. I mean, he's yeah, just Danielle, one of the best. Danielle, human- Danielle, known as Danielle Gracie, who fought in pride, right? Yeah, a- absolute legend, rock star. This huge hulking Jack dude who's just so chill. <laughs> and he like, so Danielle, like he was living there and one other gringo was living there and he rented out rooms for like $700 a month or something. The problem is he also raised pit bulls. So there's like 15 pit bull puppies and in, in down there in these kennels right outside. And uh, I'm kind of a light sleeper. Those dogs just barked all night long. They barked all night long and there were mosquitoes galore. And so I was happy not to be listening to Nelson yell all night. But back home in the teepee, it was quiet, bro. All you could hear was like faint coyotes in the distance. <laughs> so it was like, it was hard for me, man. There's like mosquitoes. And they're like, oh, the only way to deal with the mosquitoes, you have to have a fan like on your face all night. Right. Well, in Chinese medical school, that'll give you a wind invasion. That's bad. That's like worse than the corona. Right. <laughs> so I'm like trying to sleep with wind blasting on me all night pit bulls barking and i'm just like oh my god like i i, I, oh, I didn't know what to do yeah, you know the circulating the the what do you call it the fan when the it's circulating you know, fan circulating yeah. that moves up and down on your bodies to keep the mosquitoes yeah. away yeah because if you have it just on your head they bite your toes and right then you put it on the toes they bite your head right it was, it was rough man and then i'm kind of a you know i was kind of a hippie growing up so my parents were like mosquito repellent is bad like it's gonna give me cancer yeah. So like, fuck, man, I, I'm not sure what's worse. Like no sleep, cancer. Like there were some tough decisions. It was real life decisions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you got it. Was that the same place that we lived in? The, the with the kennels? And- so that was tough. And then mm-mm. no, no, those were everybody raised pit bulls there because that's obviously the best way to raise money. <laughs> right yeah like, I, I, I brought I, I, I brought i brought pit bulls to brazil as well one alberta one plus one equals what you so male female and a pit bull female uh ma- male and pit bull one plus one equals three and then you can sell the third mm. and anybody can figure that shit out so like that and they're like you bring you get an american pit bull oh dude God. that's it you know and then real so dangerous that you got to have a Diogo Argentino or a Pitbull. You got to have something, man. You got to have something that's going to eat somebody if they come to take your stuff. So yeah, man. So then 
that place, it just, I was, I was trying, it was nice, but it was really hard for me. I couldn't do it. So I talked to the girls and they're like, we know another place. And they took me and introduced me to this guy, Adam Amir, who saved my life. Cause Adam Amir was like, that again? Adam Amir. Could you repeat that again? Adam Amir, huh? This guy, Adam Amir, he lived, uh, I wonder if I'm on the wrong internet. No, that's okay. Okay. So this, this guy, Adam Amir, he, one of the things about Brazil is it's so dense jungle. Everything like grows so well that if you like, you can't just close up your house and leave for a year. Mm. Like if you leave her, you could come back and it, your house is a jungle. Like there's vines growing through it. Like the, the earth will take over your domicile. So these people had left and it was kind of a mansion. They, they, they lost all their money in one of the economic downturns. Um, you know, the economic downturns they had, frankly, probably make what we're going through right now look like child's play mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah. So a bad economic downturn, they took off. And so they, they left this guy to take care of their place. Mm -hmm. So he had this huge place and it was a mansion. There was a pool and yeah. there was like sta Roman statues around it. Yeah. yeah. It had a big tower. It was right on the water. Yeah. The problem was, that you know Adamir did what he could to keep the place nice you know but the pool was full of mosquito larvae the statues their heads were falling off uh the house they'd taken all the furniture out so there was nothing in it um you know like the the, the motorboat that used to take you there like a playboy was right. obviously not there it was a broken down rowboat right. like yeah. it was uh it was a very interesting place so it was perfect for the oxymoron gringo to live at you know I lived in a a mansion that wasn't, you know, it was like, it reminded, it reminded me of that book, The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. Didn't that have like all the fallen money? Yeah. It was like fallen money. So now we had, I'm living in this, what used to be a mansion. It's totally dilapidated, but I had space at least. And there's this mean pit bull Maui who lived there, Maui. who was actually the nicest dog in the world. He was so cool. He made me love pit bulls for the rest of my life, yeah. but nobody messed with my stuff because they were horrified of Maui. And Maui, as you remember, was one of the coolest dogs on the planet. The thing with these, the dogs, right? They, they it's not like versus people. It's like other dogs, right? They get crazy. They'll, they'll fight to the death. Oh my God. Remember that? Right? Yeah. Remember that? So there was another dog who was a cute, the cutest little, most innocent, like mutt you've ever seen. Yeah. Like you fall in love with this dog. He's so cute. But if, but if you acknowledged his cuteness, Maui had a jealousy problem. And Maui would mess him up, man. Remember we come home from like going out at night and if we didn't fight each other, then we'd break up the dogs fighting. It was one or the other, man. But if somebody had to fight at four in the morning. <laughs> oh my God. I have, I have to find the picture of us uh, fighting in the grass. Uh, like that was mud wrestling basically pretty much. You see, then we had speedos. We had, we had speedos. And speedos. We Cause we've speedos. been there for a while. We were practically Brazilian. <laughs> Man, the memory I have of Maui is uh, they were trying to they were trying to breed Maui, and you know they they, they uh, bred her with a female, and I had never seen like that happen. And just the the situation, like they were like stuck together, and he would look like he wanted to kill the female. It was tense. The female, yeah, the female wasn't happy too, but they were stuck together, right? After he finished, you know, they were stuck together. What you want in Brazil is the meanest dog because then nobody will mess with your stuff. Like the home invaders have to think twice if you've got a big old mean dog. So if you have a really mean male and then you find a really mean female, what could be better? Like you should cross those two, you know? Oh. Maui, as mean as he was with humans, he hated other dogs. He hated them. So they're like, okay, this really mean female is in heat. So let's bring her over and put her with the really mean male. They've never been together. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're like, oh my God, this is going to be the worst dog fight you've ever seen in your life. And then I actually have a picture of my office of him mounting that dog. <laughs> and then you're like, they're going to fight. Oh no, they're not fighting. And then they're, and then like, I don't know how long later, not that long later, they're still stuck together. And then you're like, they're going to fight. Yeah, <laughs> it's intense. I still have that memory in, uh, entrenched in my brain. It's crazy. Yeah, it was, it was like the definition 
of a bad relationship. <laughs> right? You're like, man, you got to get out of here. And they're like, you know, like, are you, are you, are you, no. yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> man, so, so you got, you, you got the, the kayak, so you explain that to me. And then, uh, and then you found, so you had, your, you had the place, you had the place, you had apartment your, or house, whatever you want to call it. Whatever that was, uh, yeah, it was basically a house and mansion on the on the beach that I got to stay at too. Later on, um, you had a, your jujitsu gym, um, and then uh, you had an acupuncture degree. You started working right as well as an acupuncturist in Brazil. How did that happen? Man, I got so lucky. So I worked in a lot of restaurants before I went to Brazil. That was where I met you, Alberto, right. and I worked. We worked in a, a really nice, one of the nicest restaurants in Santa Fe. It was a world famous restaurant. Like if you're pretty much. Santa Fe is a weird place because it's super depressed economy. There's no money there, but yeah. it's also this like very picturesque and kind of famous town desert. And so there's, you know, a significant amount of billionaires who live there. Like I met, <clears throat> there's a lot of wealth in that town, right. not a lot, but like freckled with like Uber wealth. Yeah. And so we worked in this restaurant. All of these people would conglomerate because it was one of the most famous places. Um, and I was a bartender and this lady showed up and she was Brazilian and she showed up at my bar and she like had a low brimmed hat. She was like kept very to herself. And mm -hmm. I started talking to her and I said, man, I'm moving to Brazil. And, and then she was, she goes, Oh, well, I'm looking at like uh, cowboy clothing. And I said, well, cool. Cause she was from Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I'll show you around. And I showed her around the town the whole next day and like showed her like a uh, jackalope pottery and all these random off the wall places, you know? And then she, uh, Turns out she's like an A-list celebrity in Brazil. Her name was Lucia Verissimo. And uh, she was with a, another girl who was married to a guy named Joe Suarez, who's like, one of, who's like the David Letterman of Brazil. So these were who turned out to be super influential and kind of famous. And she said, thank you so much for helping me. When you come to Brazil, I'll, here's my number. Call me. I'll help you out. And she had this acupuncturist who was like an acupuncturist to the stars. Um. And he, and, and she goes, I'll take you down there to meet him. And the, the, a funny thing about Brazil is that if you have an American education, it's probably like this in a lot of third world countries. If you have an American education, I mean, you could be the dumbest fucker in the world. They're like, oh my God, he's American educated. He went to an American ed university. And uh, um, so, yeah, they're like, I just got out of acupuncture school, but she introduced me to this guy and he was like, you're hired he gave me a job. So first of all, I got introduced to all these like rich celebrities through that. And I would go and work on them at their house. I do acupuncture on them at their houses. He had this spa mm. and the spa was like for the rich and famous people who come that, in on helicopters. That hotel? What was that hotel that you would all go uh, to? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a hotel in, uh, in Rio called, uh, I'll think of it. Old, it old money hotel. Yeah. What, what was it? The area, the neighborhood with the boats. Um, a Gloria. Gloria. Hotel Gloria, I think, was the, the name of it. That, that was it. And it was old, old school. You could tell it was like, this was probably like from the 1500s or something. It was a huge hotel. Yeah. Old money. And uh, yeah, that was, one of, that was one of the people that would have me come and, and do work. Uh, that was interesting because I go to her hotel and she was obviously like elite, like the yeah. bourgeois. Yeah, and was, uh, I would go and I'd go and do acupuncture on her. When I was done, she'd go, come eat with me, you know? And mm -hmm. so I'd sit and she'd have all these servants, like serve us. And then we'd eat. But when her husband was there, she'd be like, yeah, come eat. And I'd sit with the servants, you know? There was one day when <laughs> it was like her and her friend, <laughs> because her husband was never there. So uh, <laughs> it was her and her friend, you know? And, uh, and they go, come eat with us. And I'm like, cool. And I sit down and they're like, oh, you know, like, I don't know, I was probably like some cute boy toy for them or something. I have no idea, you know, but, but it was, but all I know is I was getting a good meal and I was broke as a joke. So, and I was, you know, high rolling in this nicest hotel with the owner. And so I'm sitting there and the, the servant would come over and I ate with the servant last week, you know, yeah. and the servant would come over and he'd have a tray and on the tray was a plate and on the plate was a saucer and on the saucer was a coconut water. Oh. And and they'd walk up and, and everybody be kind of looking at me because I was this walking anomaly because I was a rich American who was broke as a joke, you know, like the whole thing, you know? And, 
part of the way I feel like they end up, you end up being very judged in Brazil was your education. Like either, because if you're rich, then you're educated a certain way and you have servants and you have all that stuff. And, and if you're poor, and it's not like here where there's a middle class, like what you and I are today would be considered rich. Uh-huh. Like we would have maids and we would have cooks and we would have someone to take care of our kids, probably almost guaranteed, right? right. So everyone's kind of looking at you to see like, does he know how to like treat the maids or does he know like how to hold the fork or like bullshit like that? That I was raised with this hippie family that was like, ah, none of that stuff matters. So I would have been looked at as like somebody who's super poor, right. but I'm trying to like fit in, you know? And I also like, you know, my parents, uh, although they chose this kind of hippie lifestyle, they came from educated parents. So I'm sitting there and the, the, the maid who I ate with, you know, the week before comes up to me with like wide eyes and hands me the tray. And then everyone's looking at me to see if I like, that's what I felt. Maybe I was wrong, but I don't think so. They're all looking at me to see what I'm going to do. And I'm like, oh my God, like, do I take the, the coconut water? Or do I take the coconut water and the saucer? Or do I take the coconut water and the saucer and the plate? Or do I just take the whole tray? Uh, Like, I don't even know what to do, you know? And I worked at a lot of fine dining restaurants. Like, I should have a clue about how to drink a cup of coconut water. But it was like a super pressure situation, it felt like. So I'm like, I reach for the plate. And then the maid's kind of like shaking their head. No, no, no. And then I like reach for the plate and the saucer. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. You know, and then I drink my coconut water. It was awesome. (laughs) Good times, man. And so you, uh, you know, you, you what you, you're a Hansel Gracie black belt. What was the, you, you have a great story about meeting him for the first time. And then, and then I'd love to hear more about some of the other relationships like Sonic Kia and just meeting all the guys, you know, that you were mentored by. You know, what was your, what was your first, uh, your first meeting with Hansel Gracie? Like, man, Hanzo, as, as anyone knows, he lights up a room, you know, like if you, if you meet the guy, you, you realize you just want to be around him, you know? Um, we had just watched him, right? Uh, when that, when that uh, Valetudo event, right? Like just won maybe- World Combat Championship. I watched it. That was before I moved there. So I, I was already like, that's the guy. My teacher had told me this guy makes Hoist look like a, look like a, a gentleman. Mm-hmm. Like he, this guy is mean. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm like, no way. And then I see him fight and he just destroys three guys in one night. I mean, absolutely destroys them. And, um, and then he walks into the gym and I'm like, whoa. And I'm a, I'm a freaking pariah at the gym. Um, <laughs> and he's like, I, so I'm sitting on the other side, just watching everybody gather around him. And he looks all the way across the gym and he goes, who's that? And they're like, oh, just some dumb gringo. Not like that bad, but maybe. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, that, yeah, kind of. And uh, so a lot of foreigners going to Rio, right? And so, yeah, they weren't, we weren't looked upon very favorably, no, because everybody was trying to steal their jujitsu. And then, right. you know, the, the, there were certain guys like Henzo who were going out making money with that shit, yeah, yeah. fighting, right? You know, so it was important that they had this edge. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't blame them one bit. But uh, and then he saw me and he left everybody and walked over and was like, you know, what do you, what's going on? And I was like, oh, I came to study jujitsu. And he was like, you came all the way across the planet to live here. And learn jujitsu for my family? I said, yeah. And he goes, man, I'm so honored to have you. And it was like, like he treated me like I was something special. He recognized. Wow. <laughs> it was the first one in my life to recognize. You went from uh, sitting in the corner by yourself to hands of crazy saying, it's, it's a thank you. Not me. even that. Literally, he goes, he goes, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? I was like, I don't know, man. I'm just sitting. I'm just trying to hold up this wall, hoping someone will train with me. And he goes... <laughs> And he goes, well, he goes, well, come with me. He looked at me. He goes, you look ridiculous. Like, cause I'm dressed like horribly. He goes, you look ridiculous. Come with me. I'm going to my sponsors. I'll get you some clothes and I'll come, we'll go have lunch. I'm like, Jesus, next thing I know, I'm like hanging out with all the cool kids, you know? And then he takes me to this company. It was called Flake. Right, right. And it's spelled F-L-A-K-E, Flakey. Or maybe that's, no, maybe that's just how it was pronounced. I think it was F-L-A-K. I don't remember, but but so he took me to flake and he was sponsored by them and he goes choose some stuff and he like you like this he got me all decked out you know so then i looked like a brazilian which was my goal and i'm like this is awesome so fast forward literally 15 years later i go walking into his academy in new york city 
And, uh, and I still have that same shirt he gave me. I'm not going to throw that thing away, man. You, you know, it. like, you know, like people get, like people get like a magic, magic, you know, like um, Michael Jordan's shirt and it's sweaty and gross from a game and they, they don't wash it. No way, man. That's Michael Jordan's shirt. You know, it's like hung up all crusty and rotten. So that was me, man. I, Henzo Gracie gave me that shirt. It has a lot of like value to me. So I go walking into his academy 15 years later and he looks at me and he goes, man, what the hell is wrong with your shirt? And I go, I was all proud. I was like, what do you mean? You got this for me. Remember way back in the day, he goes, man, you got to throw that shit in the garbage. It's got holes in it here. And he freaking <laughs> takes the shirt off his back and he goes, put this one on. That one's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, that's such a classic. Sorry, man. It's such a classic <laughs> Lamal story. Yeah, well, yeah. I was going to ask you if you still have that shirt, but that kind of uh, answered the question. I had to throw it away, otherwise, I would, man. Because, yeah, anybody who knows me knows, man. <laughs> But uh, so he, so he, you uh, you uh, you he had like an injury or something, right? You tell me like you did acupuncture on him. Mm. And so when he first the met acupuncture him. hooked me up. I think I went to school all those years just so that I could work on his hand because after that I don't do acupuncture anymore, man. And I'm so never doing it again. You. Yeah, he over he went over to you and and uh, and, and talked to you. And you heard he, I did acupuncture. I was working on some of the guys, and I would bring my stuff to the academy, and I'd like do acupuncture on people like on the mat after training, you know. Yeah. Well, and so I had an electro stim machine and uh, I would put needles like someone had back pain. I would put needles in their back and then put on the electro stim and, and people were getting good results, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, man, my hand, I punched that guy in the face and I can't like my hands not working right. And I put the electro stim on and uh, it made a difference, you know, like it, it helped him work his hand after that. And so that was awesome. You know, and then like that kind of, I, that, you know, it was, it was at least a small way that I could give back. Yeah. Amazing, man. Amazing. And what was like, you started competing, you started traveling, you, you trained with the Sonaki and LeBlanc. Like, what was that? What was that? God, uh, there was, so it, it Gracie Baja and the, back then there was amazing talent. It was the best guy. Right. It's the most technical guys. It was Galino, who's I feel like is staring at me over your shoulder. Right. It was Ahsoka, um, uh, Gordo, Holeta. That's right. The master's watching. Uh, Nino. I mean, it was like this all-star team. Yeah. Um, I didn't follow basketball, but that was the all-star team right there. That was the, the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. And uh, let those portals. Yeah, it was unbelievable. But especially the gringo, there wasn't a lot of teaching going on. You would show up and train. And then a lot of the teaching just kind of happened informally. And it was probably just what was going on at that moment in the academy, you know, like it was just like, you know, there was a lot of training going on. There was amazing talent everywhere. It was more like, you know, people showing their friends cool stuff and sharing like that. Like a lot of the learning was that. And yeah. I wasn't on the receiving end of that a lot. So there was a guy, Mark Johnson. He goes, man, you got to see this guy he has a school in this place called Gavia. And he's an amazing teacher and he really, really cares. So it was like a Gracie Baja was such an all-star team. Kind of, it kind of broke up. Sonic Ian, right? You said as, yeah. a, as a gym. All-star team. And so it, it, it Gracie Baja was such an all-star team that kind of, if you were like, you know, run of the mill, who knows what the hell this guy is American. You didn't get a lot of attention. Right. Um, so the, the information was there, but you know, to extract it was a little difficult. Whereas uh, at Seneca's, it was a much smaller school and he was like raising this crop a lot like Dracolino was doing when you moved down there, you know, he was raising this first generation of his school, you know, I'm raising my crop of blue belts. And, um, and that, you know, so you got, a, you know, intense, uh, yeah, focus and somebody who really, really cared about your learning. And so that was Seneca and Seneca was the, he was the biggest rock star in the world. He had all these sponsorships like by, by like bad boy. And, and he drove a truck and he was funny and he liked to go out and, and like party and take his students out and put them in funny situations. And like, he was just a very charismatic, personable guy. And he really cared about you. Yeah. yeah. Um, still does to this day, you know, and what he was doing right. was teaching, you know? So he was like, he really cared about you, but it was also part of how he defined his own like, self in my opinion is yeah. that i you know i i'm a rock star world champion 
and and look at my students and and by sh and showing up at his school is a small school so all of a sudden it was like okay you're now my student you know yeah yeah so you were that you were part of the first world championship and i think it was in 1996 man how cool that is that right medal. yeah so could you tell me about that experience look um anybody who says participation awards don't matter <laughs> i would like to show them my participation award from the first world jujitsu championships I wish in I 1996, it. bro. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was 95. I think it was 95, actually. That, that 98 was the third. It was 95. Seven. It was 95. Yeah. No, no, 96, I think was the 96, first. 96, okay. 96, anyway, 96. I have a participation award, man. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, it was cool, man. First, I didn't know who anyone was, but there was like Gerard Gordeau and uh, who's the judo guy? Remy Pardo, is it? Remco Pardo, yeah. He got his Remco uh, Pardo, that was it. Remco Pardo was there he, competing. Right. Against Hoist Gracie. He uh ended up, later on he ended up training with Draculino, got his black belt from Draculino from uh, from the Netherlands, right? Well, well, that year he got his ass whooped right, right, by right. uh Le by uh Laboria. Right. I mean, I didn't know, so that was cool because I didn't know who any of those people were. Right. Like there was no internet. Right. There was, I mean, barely internet. There was AOL. It, I mean, AOL <laughs> dial. It wasn't internet. Yeah, there was dial-up internet. If you wanted to, you know, I didn't even talk to anyone in America. Yeah. No communication. Yeah. So yeah. I got to watch all these guys who were like the legends in the sport compete. Right. You know, I got to watch Laborio whoop Remco Pardue's ass, and Remco was a stud in his own right, rock star judo player from, you know, freaking Laborio, freaking armbarred him in like 30, 15 seconds or something yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And it was, it was cool, man. It was amazing. And then, and then Seneca would go out there and just destroy people. He, and then he, in, in the finals, there's this guy on the other side of the bracket who's destroying people, who's a mean black belt in jujitsu, but a rock star judo player. And he was crushing people and seeing us full on epons and seeing all these throwing the hell out of everybody. And I'm like, Fuck, watching and Seneca's back's all jacked up. He doesn't even train. He's like too hurt to train. He's like comes hobbling off the mat. And then I do acupuncture on him like between rounds, you know? And then he goes, and I'm like, dude, this guy can't even walk. And then he goes out there and just destroys another guy. And then he meets that guy in the finals and that guy's Megaton Diaz. And, uh, and I'm like, there's no way. That guy's a beast also, you know? And he yeah. rocks Megaton Diaz. It was amazing. Yeah. And Megaton, obviously, we know it's a living legend, you know? Yeah. How about his daughter's fight the other night? Wow. Yeah. Mackenzie. Mackenzie Dern, what a stud, huh? What a story, man. <laughs> Whole family. And, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Training, competing. The guy's still a, living, living the life, you know? Like, what a life we've had, right? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Man. You know, and then you convinced me to go down. I think that was, you went for, for six months. You showed me all those pictures, you know, of, you know, as before. I think you had some video with those big, you had a big video, like a big video camera. I'm not sure though. I still have, I, 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 I still have those tapes. <laughs> I took some video, but you had to hide the video. You had to hide it. Hold on one sec. No, not chocolate milk, but you can have the carrot. You can eat two carrots. <laughs> no chocolate milk. <laughs> Homeschooling. <laughs> That's right. This is the, yeah. He's going to be a latchkey in a second when I leave. Um, <laughs> um, where were we? Um, the, I forgot what we were talking about. Um, we're talking about the, the tournament, the worlds, and, uh, and um, I forgot what we were, I was bringing up. Uh, that crew of guys was amazing. Yeah. It, what, it, incredible luck man good times yeah and then uh, yeah you you showed me all the pictures you showed me all the pictures and all the things yeah, that you ended up doing you know and uh we started training in your garage you know and you know in your garage every single day and you know we had learned from vhs tapes right before and you know of course marco but then vhs tapes and and then you started showing me the pictures and you started showing me techniques in your garage every single day really blown my mind right with uh with just all the information and and uh just really like i was like i have to go i have to go and uh and that's how i ended up kind of making the decision to go down of course i, I don't think i don't think people can comprehend what it was like back in the day to learn jiu-jitsu 
Like there is such an immense amount of information out there. Like if you have the ability to soak up all the information that's out there, you right. can learn so much jujitsu so quickly. Right. I, 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 like I always say, man, I came back from Brazil and I knew five techniques and I whooped everybody's ass right. with five techniques. Right. I live right by the Olympic training center, Olympic caliber wrestlers, Olympic caliber judo guys didn't know an arm bar. Right. Mess them up, armbar the hell out of them. Right. Five techniques, right? And then you crush everybody. Nobody knew them. Like, ah, the way I do my side sweep and then my front choke, nobody knows that. I crush right. it. I'm right. the champion. It was amazing. It was like a superpower. And you couldn't learn that stuff anywhere else. And you know what? It turns out it's hard to make up jujitsu. Yeah, amazing, you know, amazing. That was cool. And then you came back to Colorado and, uh, you know, uh, it was before UFC got big before people really know what jiu-jitsu was right people knew what karate and taekwondo were unless they had watched those early ufcs and so could you could you do you remember those times like boulder brazilian jiu-jitsu times they look I'm, I'm gonna go back even a little before that i took some time and i went to new york in between because my grandma lived there and you'd have to come back to renew your visa and stuff so i spent like maybe a month with uh, and i lived with matt sarah and Matt, the Terra Sarah. Yeah. And uh, Matt um, was a freaking rock star jujitsu guy. Yeah. Um, not afraid of anything, as we all know now. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> so I'm living at his mom's house with him and his brother, his two brothers, Nick and, uh, and his dad. And uh, we go out to a club one evening. We're like, yeah, one night we get to go out on the town. You know, usually we train jujitsu at like two or three or four in the morning. But that night, instead of training jujitsu, we went out to a club. And I'm at the club and it's in like fucking Long Island. And like, I just came from Brazil. Before that, I didn't even know how to say hi to a girl. And, uh, and I'm sitting in a club and this girl, so I start talking to this girl and she's like, so what do you do? You know? And I probably should have said that I was going to be a lawyer or a doctor or some shit like that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, uh, she's like, what do you do? And I'm like, Oh, I, I do jujitsu. And she's like, you do jujitsu. She's like, Oh, that's great. My little sister is a black belt in Taekwondo. What belt are you? And I'm just like, Oh my God. Yeah. I had to leave. <laughs> that's what it was like, man. Nobody knew what it was. They had no idea. You could get a black belt and Lord knows what for freaking X dollars and one yeah. month or, you know, one year of training or something. Right. Right. It was weird, man. You, so I mean, when in, in getting older, I had to paint, like, I remember trying to convince the stocking boy at, at uh, King Supers that he should come try jujitsu and trying to tell him why it was cooler than karate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was like what what a grind. Yeah, I remember I remember visiting you when you first moved and helping you put up uh stapling flyers to, on Pearl Street on flyers the Bolton Bar. Flyers and Sports. flyers. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the, the marketing campaign was intense, man. Go out there, shake hands, kiss babies, try to convince people that jujitsu was good. They should come in and try out a class. Um, put flyers up everywhere, talk to everybody you could. Then the fly, when they came flyer in, that I used, they came they, in, look. After a certain amount, after a certain amount of time, you can't talk anymore. You can't just keep telling people it's better. So what do you do? You do what Hoist Gracie did, the Gracie in Action intro. Yep. So you go, look, man, I'm sick of telling you this is better than freaking that bullshit that you're trying to tell me about. It's better, okay? So just let me show you, however you want to do it. Like you want to punch me in the face, punch me in the face. Whatever it is, I'll even be nice to you. <laughs> And, and, and man, for your I had those, I had those five techniques down. So I knew you were going to get messed up. <laughs> Hell yeah. Right. Well, what was the year that you opened up your, opened up the school finally? 98. 90, end of 98. Yeah. 98. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because I was still in Brazil and you were already, I remember visiting you, you know, was helping you uh, put up uh staple those yeah. flyers onto the, the bulletin boards on Pearl Street. Yeah. That's right. My assassin little brother came to visit me. That was awesome. Cause the only people I had to train with were my students and they did, most of them didn't know anything. And Mark then Johnson. you came out and you were like frothing at the mouth. You were competing every week in Brazil. Yeah. There was like even more tournaments then than there was when I was there. That was great. So, so 98, so it's been 22 years this year of Easton's Easton. Easy, Brazil. Huh? 
what uh what are you proud of what i mean so many things are what are you, what are you top, top three things look what am i proud of that's a funny question and i'm a funny dude um something about my personality like uh I mean, there's things I'm proud of for sure. But when I look at, at my life or I see more, uh, what I could do better, mm. I don't see as much what I'm proud of. You know, I'm proud. We have a lot of great students. I have a lot of uh, great people who I feel like I've influenced their lives greatly. Um, you know, I got to do some cool stuff. I got to go back to Brazil uh, with students of mine and fight in the UFC Mm. Not me fight, but coach my students in the UFC back to the motherland. Um, you know, I, I, I got to train and, and coach, you know, and we fought, you know, Brandon Schaub fought Rodrigo Minotoro. That was a big deal for me just because, like, man, I got to go with you to Japan, you know, and, 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 and help coach you fighting in Japan. That was amazing. We got to eat uh, ramen at a Denny's. Um, you know, we have... <laughs> We, we have, uh, you know, thousands of students who I think, I believe we've impacted their lives in a positive way, but maybe it's just my personality. Like uh, that when I, when I, it's hard for me to sit back and reflect on how wonderful things are. I think more about like what I could do better. So mm. I don't know. What could it have you done better? As I said it, I was like, ah, he's going to ask me what I could have done better. <laughs> I don't know. It's little stuff, man. <laughs> It's little stuff. Talk to us. Like I, like I think there's some good. We've done some great, great things. Um, you know, you think about friendships lost or students that maybe you could have steered them in a better direction, or. Uh, but you can't think too much about that stuff. Whenever I get too down about that, I got to think, what would Henzo Gracie do? <laughs> and then I have to remind myself that I'm not Henzo Gracie, because otherwise I'm going to get in more trouble than I know how to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> but uh look, i don't even know sorry I, I've, I've avoided both of those questions you know I'm, yeah, I'm very proud of all the students and all the people whose lives i feel like we've really changed in a positive way uh i was able to help my friend adamir that helped me so much when i lived there i was able to help him buy a house and i think that he'll you know be in a much better place in his life because of that um you know i've got amazing kids and we don't have to live in a teepee yeah. Uh, not that I had to live in a teepee. My parents kind of chose to live in a teepee, but uh, so maybe I'm just proud that I didn't choose to live in a teepee. I have no idea, even though that was a great experience. Yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it's hard to, it would have to be a whole, like, uh, at least, in, you know, we wouldn't have enough time to go over all the things you're proud of and things that you may probably could have done better, right? Because we, we love and believe in the stuff so much and yeah. what it's for us and seeing it do for others. You know, I'm just grateful that uh, you influenced me to go down this path, you know, because if I hadn't met you, if you hadn't, you know, show me those pictures and show me. I, I, I am I am proud to be tied to you in some way and to think that I helped you along on, on part of that journey. You know, that like, hell yeah, that's something I'm proud of, because I know you're a great influence on a lot of people. And then through me, freaking you know convincing you or helping you get to brazil you got to meet that crazy guy over your left hand shoulder jacqueline who's an absolute beast one of my favorite people in the world um and then you know like man look where we are now yeah we're not we're not living in we have we have floors that we that you sweep <laughs> yeah you i uh, gave you a shout out your 50th birthday was uh what was it, a couple days ago this, this week Dang. Can you believe that? 50? What the hell is that? And you just made me reflect, you know, of, uh, like I said, like your influence of convincing me, but then you've been there for me, you know, in every, pretty much every important part of my, of my life when I really think about it, you know, from going down to Brazil, those, the, the, going down to Brazil, really coaching me in all these like important matches and fights, you know, from, you know, from fighting in Japan, cornering me in Japan, cornering me in the UFC, uh, um, you know, important jiu-jitsu tournaments, you know, you've seen me win, you've seen me, you know, fail, you know, um, and uh, you were even my best man at my wedding, right? You were the atheist Jew uh, uh, holding the cross up at my Armenian wedding. Amazing. 
<laughs> You're going to make me emotional. That was amazing. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't trade that for the world. Oh, man. You know, I don't know how many years ago it was now because the years go by, right, so fast. But like maybe six years ago with where we got to basically, we just happened, we didn't plan it. I happened to go to Brazil with my family. You happened to go to Brazil with your family. And I called you up. Hey, what are you up to? Hey, I'm in Brazil. I'm at the island that we lived on. And Full we circle. Got, and we got to basically, you know, meet up, have stay in the same uh, uh, place, same same apartment, same uh, Airbnb on the island we lived with our kids and we got to hang out that week. We got good, got to go hang gliding. I uh, got to, uh, I mean, I mean, just, just. Our kids got to hang out and play together, train right. jujitsu together. That was right. amazing. Right. So man, I, I can't even say I, like, I'm grateful. I'm thankful. Like, I mean, you, you changed my life and, and uh, I'm better. I'm, you know, I can't even, there's a dozen words I can say to, to tell you what you mean to me, you know? So you know, always great talking to you. Um, hope to see you soon. Hope to see do, talk some more in person when you're in LA and we'll get past this uh, COVID situation, you know, and hope to see you in, in Colorado soon as well. Alberto, you're going to make me all emotional and cry. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing me along on all those crazy adventures as well. You know, like when you call up and said, I'm fighting a pan. I'm like, man, how cool was that? Yeah. Um, so, man. You're one of my you're one of my top three proudest things. See, I'm gonna cry now. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Love you, man.